So uh, we'll start off uh, with another lady. Um, uh, Esperanza Montero will tell, tell us about how to make LARPs international. She comes from Spain and with a huge, huge ton of uh, experience in these things. So uh, without much further ado, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with so many great I have so many great talks, and I have a first question. How many of you are LARP organizers in this room? Okay, everyone. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Okay, we have... I, I'm sorry then this, this talk may, maybe would be a little bit boring for you. It's just more thought uh, to, uh, for organizers. Uh, so... I'm going to start with myself because I think it's important to speak about who we are uh, because it's my point of view that is unique because I have some specifics. So I'm uh, 42, I'm from Spain, I have a background, I studied media, so when I think about arts, I tend to use media production structure when I think about that. Uh, this has been how our organization has been related. I'm an activist, I'm bisexual, I, that's why I, cho I chose this picture. Uh, I have I mean, everything that I do is super political because in our organization we think we believe in something that we call LARPtivism. That means using LARP as a political tool. So what we do usually is like, yeah, I'm going to play a LARP in the space. No, you, yeah, sure, but you're going to speak about racism, about scores, cards of war, and we're going to treat high oppression. I want, I'm want. i going to play a LARP uh, related to Westworld in Spain uh, in, a, in a cool um, cinema setting. Yes, we're going to speak about intersectional oppression. You don't know it when you sign up, but we plan it to happen. So yesterday I learned it could be called like a form of edu LARP, depending on how it's done and depending on how is the briefing. Sometimes we do the briefing like that way and others we don't. So not only LARP is a very young organization, I think we are four or five years old. And we started uh, with, uh, Enrique is my, my usual co-designer, co-everything, and everything I do is uh, one of my best friends. And we were sitting in, in our, uh, in, in, our um, in, in, in our dorm, speaking about what we wanted to do. And it's like, why if we make an organization as the Polish people are doing, but not with Danish people involved. Just we Spaniards decide to make our own international LARPs in a place that we know that is cheap for production, in a place where we can do big productions and we have really cool scenarios, we could really cool locations to do stuff, and we don't need any Nordic to do that for us. So it was our beginning. So we had two goals. I think we pretty much succeeded in what we wanted. First of all, make international LARPs in Spain. And as a consequence to that, bring more Spanish people to the international games. Because when we make, usually the, the, the things that happen with uh, local players that don't usually speak much English, they are super worried about speaking in English and LARPing in English. But if you do it in my town, maybe I will go. And that is how we started bringing some international Spaniards to the international scene. This is the first international LARP ever made in Spain. It, it was, it's an organization, it's called Somnia. They have been doing international art since, I don't know, uh, four or five years. But it was the first attempt to make an international, what they did, and I think it works when you are not super sure about going international, is they, they, they reserve some spots for international players. So it's like, we're going to make a design for Spaniards that we know that we will come because they know us and they know that we do good LARPs, and let's, add like five or four, or four uh, spots for internationals with a special design because you need to design for locals having to interact with the others. So it's like the bosses are going to be the international ones. So it's the best way that they are going to be speaking with the other. Our first experience was a LARP called Blue Flame. We tried to do this, but something will happen because um, when we opened the sign up, then we found out that half of the players, not five or ten, were internationals. That was complicated because it was our first weekend LARP as organizers. So we needed to change the whole team to be able to write in English, 
we were not ready. We were like two people able to write in English. So we started recruiting people and finding proofreaders because we don't speak really good English. And we are aware of that. So we usually have the part of people checking our grammar or checking that we are writing is not written by a toddler. And this is what is happening right now. Well, after that, we, we did some other labs. Uh, we made conscience. Uh, we are now, we made the Red Center. And we're now in Mission Together and Violetas. We're making, our, our usual strategy is we make a big LARP. And we make a more experimental personal LARP. That is the small one where we test the weird things that we cannot do in, in blockbusters. All of them with the idea of trying to make people think about stuff. What is the problem when we think about internationalization of LARPs? Our main problem is this. Are the international LARPers, I was checking uh, yesterday the Globe Totten LARPers uh, Facebook group, where there are many LARPs advertised. There is a LARP every weekend in this year. And we are in March, so not all LARPs have been advertised. So this is the, the most complicated problem that we're facing as organizers. It's like, there are tons of LARPs everywhere. So what I'm going to do to try to attract players to my LARP when most international don't know me? Oops. So there are some things that uh, we think that is important for the international audience. Your LARPs needs to be an interesting LARP. There's a trick that we were speaking about uh, yesterday with Simon, <laughs> and we had the conversation. It's like, if you have an awesome location, they will come. I mean, you need to offer something that is different. In our case, it was, you're going to go to a real Western studio to play a Western LARP. In your case, you have amazing like, locations. I have so, I've seen some of them, but it's, you need to offer something that is different because you have a cool location, a story that has never been told before in that way. You need to have good communication. We will speak about what we understand as good communication. Of course, you need to deliver. I mean, control the expectations and give what you promised. You need to be reliable on safety. This is very important because I mean, I was speaking with Simon yesterday, it was fun. He's like, no, but we don't have a safety team in this lab, but you're Swedish. Everyone in the international scene assumed that you're Swedish, so you're taking care of the safety. But when you're for a, from a country that most international LARPers don't know, they're super worried about if your safety uh, design is accurate, if they're going to be safe playing, depending on what you do. We will get to there later, don't worry. And of course, they need to trust you, or at least have fulfilled these other points well enough. So it's like, let's give them an opportunity. An opportunity that will have a cost of plane ticket, hotel, your LARP. <coughs> I mean, you need to offer something that is super attractive to them. So thinking about design, uh, this is what we did uh, for Mission Together. Uh, these are the, the, the entire relationship nets of all of the 145 characters. That is kind of uh, weird. Um, how do, do we usually design? We think about the concept, something that you can sell in one sentence. Uh, in Hollywood, it's called elevator pitch. That is, you have only two minutes to speak with your producer, so you need to sell what is your LARP about. It could be. Uh, for example, one of your LARPs in one sentence. Uh, superheroes voting for Goldie. For example, that's an example. One of your LARPs, for example. Um, uh, we have the um, science fiction gender norm LARP for teenagers. Cool. When you listen to that, you know what you're going to play. Not every time, because you're assuming things. When you think about your first concept, they will assume, so it's sci-fi, and you have, uh, sorry, it's, it's fantasy, and in this case, they are feminists. You're saying it with 
wrong day, wrong day. <laughs> so with that, I mean, we need to first think about the first sentence of what is our LARP about, to be able to think who is our, our audience, who is the tone, uh, who is everything. Something that we usually do as organizers, we have the plot writer lead, and he knows everything. Cool. What if your plot writer has an accident? What if, if your plot writer is ill? Or if they decide to leave at some point because they're not happy, you have any kind of problem at the organization, and they decide to leave? You're fucked up. So, all written. In organization, we work with... Uh, I, I could spend another hour speaking about how we organize the plot part, but we usually what we feel is like, we have a, lim a limited time for, from people who are doing it on a voluntary basis, so in their free time, and life is more important than their voluntary time. So you need to have super short tasks with written information. So we start with having the idea, then we get to the design document. You need to have not only plot, but also everything related to your logistics. Example, what is covered and what is not covered with the price. Is there a large bus or is not? If you're trying to have uniforms or not, how much are the uniforms? I mean, you need to think a lot, a lot of other things that are not only plot related. But you need to have that information. And then we get to the character design, where we, we have first discuss all the plots. I mean, our, our mission together docu plot document has around 100 pages right now. It's like plot. And Tina uh, had a relationship with Peter, and uh, Peter cheated Nina with Tom. So we have the different ideas of who saw it, who did everything. So you have all of the plot functions. So in the moment you were going to start writing the, writing the character, you have all of the idea about how is the plot about. We do it with every plot that we have with the character. When we're speaking about plot, it's something, uh, something active to do or some information that you have, but you, can, you need to be able to play on it. Uh, something that we usually do as, as uh, designers, sometimes we consider plots that are not plots. If I have an information, that's not exactly a plot, because I need to be, that is a passive plot, because someone needs to ask me for me, to, about information so I can directly be involved in a plot. Or if someone needs to do something so I can play the plot, then it's a passive plot. We cannot rely on other players to activate the plots for others. So we need to include uh, some things to do. And what we usually do is we have the core idea, the themes, and everything, every plot has something to do with the themes. So it's, if it's about racism, in the case of Mission Together, all of the plots will be related to what happened in the world, who killed who, who did horrible things to the others. So with that, we can articulate and make the players play with the themes that we want. Other things that we will have, we will have relationships. Well, as we see, we have meaningful things to do, meaningful relations. So it's super important regarding relationships. Actually, what we do is we, we have a meeting with all of the plot writers and we fix and we feed what is the minimum of an, a good character sheet for that specific LARP. So we say, for example, in Mission Together, we're speaking about from nine to 11 relationships, at least five important for the character. So it's not your neighbor. It needs to be your friend. It needs to be your, someone you have an important relationship. We have also added from five to seven plots things to do. Sometimes it could be personal plots or it could be group plots. For example, personal is regarding that you have a conflict because you're in love with someone of another race and they killed your brother. So with that, you have a conflict to play on. But in other cases, uh, the best pilot is going to be the pilot of the bridge of the final spaceship, for example. That is a group plot. But you need to have different plots. And also, not dependable on one player. Because as we said before, player can decide not to play on that. So what we do is, if this, there's a plot that is important and it relies on players, we at least have three players that have that plot. So they can start the plot. We are, we are sure that 
one of the three players will ha make it happen. If we want to make it it's super sure, it will be three, two players and an NPC to activate the plot. Or if you have a secret and you want this, that secret to be spread, you at least need three characters to be sure one of them NPCs. It's, it's usually we follow this kind of rule. I'm sure you have also yours because you're also an organizer, so you have your, your way to do it. Uh, we have two, so we have different sp steps. We have the plot writing, idea, design document, plots, design of character with the plots they're involved and the relationships they have. And then we have a writer. Then we have a playability and coherence test. That's a check. That is something that I do. I read all of character sheets and said it makes everything makes sense and all of the characters are playable. And then we have the English proofreading because we don't speak good English. And it's totally okay to not speak good English, but please have proofreaders to do that work for you. So with that, we can guarantee that a character has at least three different plot writers checking it. In some cases, five. So it's the best, it's the best way to have like the same quality of work for each character. It's, you can get to the situation because it's my friend, I, in this page, this character is going to have uh, 100 pages and but everyone else will have five. It, it doesn't happen in all LARPs. Oh, this is also what international LARPs are going to expect. Depending on the, on the culture, for example, in my culture, we write everything. For example, in some Nordic cultures, uh, Swedes, for example, you don't write everything. And sometimes they make their own character sheet or they make their own relationships. I'm speaking in, in a culture where, we, where you find a full character sheet with all of the information. And you say, yeah, can I make some extra relationships? See, but, but don't forget to play the relationship that you already have. So this is how we do it in inner culture. But if we get to, to this, finally, what we're thinking is in having a full character sheet with uh, the same amount of quality for all of the players. Uh, communication. Well, the first step is to think what we're going to communicate. It's like the short sentence, the signed document. So who I'm going to face. Uh, I have written all of this part with all of the mistakes we have made. I think it's really fun uh, and it's a be better way to actually understand uh, some things. <coughs> Communication problem one, uh, conscience. It was our international LARP, big, big international LARP. Um, when we started it, I was super worried because we were charging 225 euros. That was the most expensive LARP ever in Spain. And everyone, everyone, everybody wanted to kill us, and I was super worried because no one will sign up. We have players enough for three runs because people start signing up, and at some point it was super stressing because we saw many of the gods of LARP. I mean, in the Nordics, Nordic designers for us, it was the, the gods of LARP, and it was like, oh fuck, if we fuck up, no one, we will never be able to play a LARP or make a LARP ever. So with this amount of pressure. We forgot something. So we added that the, the people will sleep in a, dorm, in a dorm. In Spain, usually the dorms are, for, are from 50 to two people. So we had a, an emergency communication when at some point, it was, it was like three months before the LARP. I mean, it was not in the beginning. So all company employees will sleep in a dorm. And then we started to see many people super angry reacting at us. But it's a dorm. So we had like five people looking at different dictionaries to find how many people would, should fit in a dorm. Because it seems that in other cultures, when, they, when you think about the dorm, you're speaking about eight max, but not in ours. And we couldn't find it in any dictionary. Because we are from different cultures. Right now, if you see any of, your, of our LARPs, it's super clearly stated, dorms of, from, too. But that was a super, I mean, that was super problematic for us because we had some players that didn't only want to, I mean, they only wanted to have six people max in the dorm. I'm not sure if it was part of their culture or not, but it was a problem of communication at the moment. My advice with that, ask people from different countries to check your websites if you're going international. Because you might be missing a super important point or you might be offending someone without wanting to offend them. Another communication problem. Well, it's, it was not exactly a communication problem, but 
in conscience, uh, we get to, we got to this uh, safety this system. So depending on these things, depending on the color that you were wearing, you were started a negotiation. It was stated on the website that everyone should have a negotiation of game to play sexual violence. We had a special protocol thought of how to play on sexual violence, considering that it should be in special places. So if you didn't want to see this kind of scenes, you could avoid looking at it. But it was one of the themes of the game. This means that you will know that this had happened. And we had the Italian and Spanish problem. Yeah, our own people fighting with us. Uh, it was fun uh, because uh, they didn't read the off-game negotiation and when we stated the specifics that you need to speak with the person, ask them, tell them what you're gonna do, ask them about the boundaries. For some uh, international LARPers that were Italians and Spanish, it was like, oh, but what about my immersion? Yeah, I mean, because there are people who, for them it's super important that part, it's like, so negotiate with, with many people before, so you don't need to care. I mean, you can even have your notes for raping people, but you need your notes, because we stated that that was important for the negotiation. Of course, if you know the other player, and, and you usually LARP with them, sometimes you don't need to do that, because you know the other, but with a stranger, we said that. <coughs> so it was more not related what we missed in the website, but what they understood. But if we had stated the whole safety system, including uh, how was the negotiation, they would have nothing to object. But it was not written, it was not stated, so it was problematic at that point. All of this meant hours and hours of not sleeping. Another communication problem, Red Center. So we launched this website. Uh, I was very surprised because I was expecting the backlash that we had with this game with, with Conscience, not with Red Center. Because in Conscience, sexual violence was part of the themes, but in Red Center was not. Uh, I mean, it's, it's about uh, Handmaid's Tale, so sexual violence is part of the themes, but it's not an active, it's not something that is going to happen. So in the United States, some people didn't read this part that says safety. It has the whole system of safety. And they started to think that we didn't have a safety system. And they also started to say that, because we said everyone will be a female, because it was a LARP only for women and non-binary people. Um, and we said that there might be an NPC, a male NPC. So they immediately assumed that that male NPC was going to rape everyone. And it, just, it was just for one of the ending scenes, nothing to do with that. So we had to fight this backlash because players don't read. That's another important thing. No matter how, I mean, if it's big and it's bold and it's red, they won't, they won't read it. Or they will understand what they want to. So, lessons. Your culture is not everyone's culture. Ask everyone you have around. Players don't always read. Manage expectation. Super clear stated. Because for them, it's a contract. What is in your website, it's a contract. Add the design document with everything that you're going to do. I mean, at some points when we advertise the labs, we don't know all of the techniques that we're going to use. But please communicate them to the players as soon as possible. Talk to your target. I think Simon spoke a lot about this yesterday, about the target, the audience that you have. What is your audience? Who are you going to advertise it to? And be humble and learn from your mistakes. <coughs> we, where should I advertise them? Globetrotting LARPers, I think there's 2,500 2, members right now. LARPers BFF, and if you want to advertise to Spanish LARPers, Spanish LARP. Okay, uh, we call production everything that is, some people call logistics or produ production or project, project management. So, this email saying that our app was rejected was a week and a half before conscience. All of the robots, I don't know if you know about, if you know about conscience, it's a lab based in Westworld, so we have 
robots in a, in a Western park, and we had the whole company. We had uh, the plot writers, the people who care about their behavior, and the maintenance guys. So the communication with the robots for changing their character sheet and for changing everything uh, was uh, the app. So I think most of you already know this, but make a plan B of technology. It was super scary. And we had to contact all of the players to ask them for a specific number that was very difficult to find for not nerdy people with their phones. We, we sold it, but this was super scary. Another problem, and this is a cultural problem. In Spain, I think we have like a five or two percent people, people who are vegan or vegetarian. So what happened is international LARPers were expecting to have naturally a vegan option. For our culture, naturally, no one was vegan. Ask them. I mean, we, found, we solved it, but it was problematic as part of the, of, of the experience. Uh, this is very common, I'm going to choose to be, it, it happens depending on the LARP, but if you try to save money in some places, you will, you will uh, lose part of your team. I mean, if you try to make them do things that are super problematic as cleaning dishes or cleaning or not everyone is super happy for doing so, sometimes it's easier to actually hire people to do some part of the stuff. But you're all experienced organizers, so I'm not going to speak much about this. And this was the last one. Uh, check the location and try to find locations that are reliable. It, it was fun. We tried to make a LARP in the Canary Islands. We ended up moving it to, to uh, Madrid because it was impossible to make a LARP there. I mean, we had the commitment of the location, and they called me like a month before to tell me, hey, uh, do you remember the location you had? You don't no longer have it. They said, don't worry, we already changed the, the, the entire location because we didn't trust you. <laughs> I mean, it was impossible to make a LARP there. So please try to find first the commitment of the, of the location. And also, I mean, if there's a way to make it in your country, to have any kind of uh, refund in case of cancellation or penalty in case of cancellation because it can be problematic. So, players don't always write, but you have to write it. Again, your culture is not everyone's culture. The questioners, but allergies and food preference include vegan and, and vegetarian because it, it must not be part of your country, but it can be part of other countries' uh, culture. And be, make a plan B, C, D for technology. And the same, I think we, we all have written this. Be humble and learn from the, your mistakes. I think also had Simon the same sentence. About safety. Uh, I don't know, do you have in your countries a safety system or safety culture or safety teams? Some people are looking at me with, what the fuck is that? Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you what we do, but what we do is not a standard and it's part of who we are, so, but mostly what we have is we have a special group of people in the team that is a safety team. So we have, every time we have a code of conduct, so in, in my case, I'm bisexual, I pretended for years to be straight in the LARPing, in Spanish LARPing community because I was super scared to be discovered because I didn't know how they were going to react. Funny thing, half of the Spanish community that is LARPer, they are bisexual, but I didn't know. But so many people, I'm speaking about non-binary, trans people, uh, LGBT, I mean, any kind of the letters of the LGBTQ, we won't be feel super welcome unless we are told that we are welcome. Or unless we know that there will be consequences if someone does bad things to us. So we have a call of conduct of what is, what can you do and what cannot you, you, you do, so you, you know what to expect from the organization. And also we have that team, so any player can speak to the safety team uh, and they will in confidential information. So the safety team can directly say, this player is not going to the LARP. And we, anyone else is allowed to ask. So no one is allowed to ask to the, to the safety team. Why? 
because we manage a lot of confidential information, we all know that in our communities we have exceptional players, but some are not so exceptional in some places of, in their lives. I mean, when speaking of predators, every gaming culture has problems, and we are not an, ex an exception in that. So we have a team to actually be able to check. Most of the things that, that uh, safety team manage are miscommunications. It's like, see, he said this because of that, and you sh listen to the other version, it's like, you should talk together, because he didn't mean, she didn't mean, they didn't mean, you, you know what I mean. But sometimes you can find people who sign up for LARPs that are problematic and can be a risk to your player. So it's super important that you are able to manage that. And also it's super important that you have safety techniques or the internationals feel safe with you. Because if they don't feel safe, I mean, there are many stories of, of companies that have failed because of this part, or lab organizers that have failed because of this part. I mean, it's nothing that is going to be a short term, but it will be a mid-term problem. So what, what we did in the beginning, it was, it was not in my organization, but it was in the labs I was. Uh, in my usual group of players that we were, we were going to manage this, this Spanish LARP, uh, we thought that, that playing with rape was OK. And of course, it is not OK to not state it. And there was a massive problem in this LARP because we were assuming, I'm not speaking about Spain, but a specific group of players. So when we invited everyone else, that was problematic because that was one of the themes. And we didn't disclose openly that was going to be one of the themes. So when we're speaking about safety, again, your culture is not your, everyone's culture. You need someone in the group of the team that can handle confidential information and they will have authority to make decisions. And code of conduct, safety te techniques as a part of the design. I don't know if you, you usually work with safety techniques like safe words or this kind of, okay. State them publicly. Not, not only in the, the workshops, say it before. Say it in the website. Because that will start, will help you to build trust with your players. Add themes, as straight lines, important topics or complicated topics, as, as them, add them as a theme. Or, and actually what we do right now is like, this is a theme, this is not a theme. To avoid having these kind of problems, because if not, it will, it will change. And be humble and learn from your mistakes. About the trust in organizers, it's something that you need to build. The name is something that you need to build and they will only know about you when you come. And, but if you manage the other steps well, the safety, making a good LARP in a place that is cool or is new for the international community, you will earn their, their trust. But something super important to, to earn the trust is also to know who you are. For example, in my organization, we have been focused in showing acti actively that we are activists, we take safety very seriously, and when we fuck up, that we do as everyone, uh, we are humble and we try to learn from the experience. This is part of who you are, and you need to say this openly to the, to the players as well. I mean, it needs to be stated in the website, and it's easier to build a name or a trust when you're super sure about who you are. So think about who are you as an organizer? What makes you different from the others or similar to others, but what is most important for your organization? Because with that, you can start building the trust. And that was it. I don't know if you have questions. Also, I feel that many of the things that I was speaking about, I mean, many of the you already know, but I think it was important to state everything. Uh, there was a question here. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not a question. This is me. Is this working? Do you know? Or should I just speak louder? Or can you actually hear it? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. We can switch them. Okay, this is me just making a point because we're the last day at a conference. People are tired. I also hear a lot of coughing all over the room. That might be, you're a smoker, you were up late last night, now you're coughing. It might be you got a cold, it might be you have corona. 
And I want to remind everyone, if you cough in your hand and then touch something, and someone else touches that, like this microphone, and they touch their face, they will probably get sick. That means every time you cough, you need to cough in your arm. As soon as you cough in your hand, you're contagious. So you need to wash your hands before you touch anything. And we are a lot of people from a lot of countries, so we probably have different germs and will make each other sick. Let's try to not do that. So now you're probably going to have to hold this one <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> there was uh, you. All right, so uh, you said at one point that you didn't really feel safe about your sexuality when it uh, came at coming out in love. And so has your experience with new players changed over the years? So you are 42, like you said, so I imagine you started LARPing way back when maybe that was more recently. <laughs> it was like seven or eight years ago. Um, but... I was not sure about how everyone was going to react. I have been, uh, I mean, in that moment, I had been the president of the biggest organization in Spain. I mean, it was very easy to see I was bisexual because I was very open about that. But when you are not part of the norm, or when you are not part of the privileged group, you feel unsafe when you don't know the people. So it's like, I'm going to open up my feelings and everything because it's what you do in LARP. I mean, it's like you play and you get intense motions and everything. but I was not sure if I was going to be safe stating openly, hey, I'm bisexual. Because uh, all of the LGBTQ community, we all have been taught during our life that there might be bad reaction of who we are. For example, in a job at some point, uh, no one wanted to get changed with me in the same room, yeah. for example, something like that. And so I'm not saying that I was expecting that from the LARP, LARP community, but I was scared of not being accepted. So, and for an, for an organization, it's super easy. You only need to say, we don't accept any kind of discrimination because of this, this, and that. And when you see it, then you feel safe. It's super easy. But it's complicated to see it when you're straight because you're accepted everywhere. Uh, I think this one works now. What we actually found out is in, in Serbia, we're considered a bit of a backwater place, and I don't say that very proudly. But what I did like about our community and uh, what might also work for you, but again, you're more of a niche and specialized. So uh, when we started introducing like these kinds of rules and uh, uh, when we said that, oh, you know, no discrimination or anything, we actually got a bit of a feedback from the LGBTQ community that they were then fe feeling more endangered or singled out in a sense that you know there was still this kind of barrier like watch out but when we didn't do that what actually happened is that players of course we had some minor problems but never anything like major uh, people actually integrated more naturally into the game in a sense that uh, you know these things would come out, <coughs> people wouldn't, uh, let's say, push their sexuality on others, whether it was, you know, LGBTQ or straight or whatever. And, you know, whenever people would feel either discomforted or anything, like, let's say, a straight person was hitting on an LGBTQ or vice versa, they would just be like, oh, you know, man, thanks a lot for the compliment, that's not my style, but, you know, you made my day at least. Because, and we went from this, like, let's call it, playful play down or friendly play down to actually then people you know slowly integrating them very normally into the cycle and then that no longer being the question so do you think that maybe be a better approach like not stating you know no discrimination or anything so letting it integrate naturally or do you still prefer like making a rule set for an international audience state it openly because it's the only way that we know i mean especially when you're going we are going to a country that we don't know i mean Actually, I, I had to check with, interna uh, with International Amnesty that picture. I was like, I don't know this country I'm going. I don't know how are the rights there. Thanks, you have an amazing country for that part. <laughs> but in some places, just having that picture would me me in jail or me dead. So, I mean, so when you're international and queer person, 
actually we are now attracting many queer people because they know many of us are queer, are queer so, but, but it's, it's better if you stay openly. Because it's not about me feeling welcome, but people who are not reacting well to me having consequences by the organizers. You, you know what I mean? Uh, Exactly. Exactly. Uh, would you have an example of uh, the uh, safety mechanics in uh, with words and with the gestures? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, um, there are many. What we usually uh, work with this is the OK checking mechanic. It's super good because you can be immersed. And so I can be shouting at you, and with this I'm asking you, are you player okay? <laughs> and the player can say, I am okay, so-so, or I'm not okay. So you can be shouting at someone or even fighting, and the other crying horribly, and you don't know the other, but you can ask without breaking immersion, how are you? Other thing that we do, we use, we use uh, the safe words. That we, we work with green, that is a suggestion. It's like, I would like to increase the intensity of this. Yellow, take it easy, or any kind of word. I mean, you need to have some specific words. And red, that means stop the scene. Something that we also do is every time that someone push a sets a boundary, say red or stop or whatever, we thank the other. Because we can learn because there are boundaries. That, there are some examples where I would be super happy to, if, if any one of, of you is interested in safety, <coughs> There are a couple of groups of Facebook with super good people in safety, so we, I can introduce you to them. Or, and if you have any kind of question regarding anything, I mean, you can contact me, as I think many of us uh, can help you with that. Thanks for the question, Mick. But uh, you stated that, like in several slides, that it is a problem that that players usually don't read, or many times they don't read the the material. And how do you like? How do you compensate that? We usually fail <laughs> because there are people that even if you send them ten emails and it's written in every document and you say in the workshops, they won't listen. But there's something super important when you're an organizer that you have a responsibility as an organizer. So it's better to say sorry, but this was stated in the themes. Check the website and send them the website back, I have said it. It's not my responsibility if you didn't understand. Of course, in very important things, you don't only need to write it down, but workshop it, make them rehearse it. I mean, safe words is better if you put everyone to rehearse it so they can feel comfortable saying them. And some things cannot be just transmitted by, I mean, there are many things that you need to, to work with them. but. Reading things, they won't bring. I mean, and it's problematic, and it's also super frustrating with the players that actually do read. It's like, why you always say this? Because there are people that keep on asking on that on Facebook. I, I haven't talked about this, but boundaries are super important with players. Uh, we no longer reply uh, to any message that is not an email. I discovered at some point I wanted to kill myself when there was, we were like a, a week before a LARP, and we had a LARP a month after, and at some point it's like, why am I so stressed? Because I'm replying to 20 different people by different messages. WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, audio message calling me. It's like, stop that. Set, a, set only one way with many people who can do that work so it doesn't rely on one person and set the boundary. That has improved my life as a person, really. Coronavirus. Now, now, no one, now no one wants to take the microphones. <coughs> Sorry. I survived the swine flu, I think. Okay, so uh, I wanted to ask about the part where you said that uh, it is important to state who we are. And uh, I can uh, interpret it in at least two ways. So I wanted to check with you what exactly you mean. So uh, from one part, I understand that it's... Uh, important to have like a real person behind uh, you know just the name of the organizers team like you know like uh, faces but also if i understood correctly you want to uh, also show to the players that uh, your backgrounds uh, 
support the themes that you are working with? Is that correct? Th there are different things. It's like, one, what is the identity of your LARP? So that means what themes has it and who is the team behind that specific LARP? But there's something, something super important is about the uh, organization. I mean, you as an organization, even if you don't want it, you have a personality for the people who are signing up. Unless it's one LARP, there's no, then there's the persons who are behind it. But it's one organization. That means you have to some, some values attached to your organization. So with that, for example, I'm going to put you an example in our organization. Uh, every part, every member of the staff signs a special code of conduct that is even more restricted than the players. For example, I mean, they, they need to, to, to sign many things, including, for example, that they, they are not going to use their privilege as an organizer uh, to, to uh, at the after large parties, for example. It's like, you're not going to use this. And they sign it. Because this is how we are as an organization, and it sets, sets how, can, how, how is our organization. Um, I have a question. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what did you find most challenging when, when trying to make an, a LARP an international one, you personally? Most challenging? I think I think uh, me as an, a project manager, I have been involved in every time a worse project in terms. I mean, more complicated. It's just a moment. It's like we started with 50 players, and now we are in two runs of 240 people in total, and building many spaceships and managing a team of 60 people. Uh, I think it's myself <laughs> committing to things that are super complicated, but. Right now, I think it's the most complicated parts when you have a big project is to manage the team. Because if you're in charge of writing and production and you have to manage a team of many people, only managing the team is just a task for one person. So it could be that. Uh, and have another. Uh, how do you manage uh, uh, difficult players? Ah, it's, it, that is easy. Uh, I love, I love the Simon's approach because it's mostly what we do. Um, we are not organizing for profit. This means that we are giving a present to players. So if it's something that I give for free, then it's something I can decide to whom I give it. So in our orga, our personal safety as people is the most important thing. It's like, so if we have, if we find a problematic player, we try to speak with them. If it gets super problematic, we are happy to remove them from the game. I mean, someone that is really hurting the safety or hurting the player for others. And if they have been complica super complicated to manage, for us it's easier to survive ourselves. Because if we let ourselves burn out, then the other players will never play a LARP from us because we will stop making LARPs. So take care of yourselves. You see people who are super, we, we, we call it the customer approach. Have paid this and so I'm a customer. I'm sorry, you're not. You have paid for the material. You have not paid for my time. This is, I mean, even if we're charging for it, this is a community building something and that includes you building as a community. So they are not welcome and that's okay. And we're super open about that. Do you have any suggestions for encouraging people who are quiet or shy to approach organizers with problems that they have? That is a huge problem. Actually, even if we say it many times, what we try to do is we try to have a, we have like every organizer, we work with a lot with uh, secret NPCs, even as GMs or groups, but we try to have everyone attached to uh, a GM. It's the person who gives them the, the, the workshops, it's the person who is in charge of them. So the first uh, question that we have in the meeting is like, how are your players? Is anyone bored? Is anyone quiet? So we try as a group to, in that meeting, it's like, how can we do so this? this player can stuck to other people. 
Of course, there are many people that we clearly fail because it's complicated to do so. But I think the best approach that we have is to actually delegate in many people trying to second players. But it's not, it's, it's not possible to actually, yeah. Anyone else? Um, okay, that's it. Uh, thank you, Esperanza. Thank you. <laughs>